Okay. We want to thank you all for being here today, folks. And uh, we're in part two of dealing with stress of caregiving. And we're going to be focusing in today on four particular things that are stressors for caregivers. Uh, we started out by talking about, in part one, about the disease itself and how that creates stress and then how stress can present itself in various forms that you may not uh, initially figure out that that's what's really going on and because something else kind of is dominating you and your emotions. So you may wanna check into part one if you haven't seen that already. With part two, what we're gonna be focusing in on is these four enemies. If you can kind of reframe the way you think about your caregiving uh, and think in terms of the fact that there are going to be some enemies you run into and they're not going to be the people like in your family that you wish were going to show up. They're not going to be that doctor who just won't really give you any any kind of proper treatment for your loved one's form of dementia. A lot of people here are dealing with Lewy body dementia and a lot of neurologists just don't know how to handle that or aren't confident in it. And so those people aren't your enemies. They're just people you're gonna to have to navigate either with or around. Uh, and in the case of the medical community, you need to run away from that person and try to find some medical provider who can give the care that you and your loved one deserve. But the four enemies we're gonna key in on today are things that can really, really hurt you. And they can hurt your loved one because they impact you and they drain you in some way. And those things we're talking about today are exhaustion, anxiety, guilt, and worry. So let's first dive into exhaustion. We all know that caregiving is exhausting. There's no doubt about that at all. You have one body, but now you may feel like you're carrying two people in that body. You are responsible now for not only yourself, but for the safety and the well-being of another human being. And that's heavy and it's hard. And so exhaustion may well set in on you and it can make you sick. It can make you very sick. It can take you out potentially. It almost did. This happened with me. I let myself get too exhausted and it's very common. Uh, so I'm just trying to give you a heads up. If you're fairly early in your journey, you may not have run into this yet, but you might. And if you do, please remember that you are just as important, just as precious to God as your loved one is. So what are you going to do about this enemy called exhaustion? Because you have to recognize and deal with this enemy. Because if you fall, if you crash because of exhaustion, your loved one's going to fall and crash with you. And we don't want that to happen. So first and foremost, you need to be sure you protect your sleep. This is likely going to creep up on you. Uh, the issue, like I said, almost took me out and it often does take out other caregivers. I hear about it often when I work one on one with people and uh, who are dealing with dementia caregiving. So please be careful to protect your sleep. And we're going to be talking about some details of that as we go through this lesson. Um, Pay for the things that you should not do if you possibly can. This is a time when all that money you've saved up, you need to start investing in having somebody maybe come in and stay the night and you, you build a nest for yourself somewhere in the house and get yourself some rest. Uh, you may have to adapt your schedule where if they're taking a nap, you stop what you're doing and you take a nap too. If they get into a pattern for a period of time where they're up more at night and sleeping more during the day, you may need to adjust some of your sleep pattern to match that pattern and not just keep on keeping on no matter what. Because if you keep on keeping on and staying awake, you're going to become exhausted. That's guaranteed. If you don't have the money to pay for certain things, then this is when you have to kind of get over yourself and forget your pride and say, I need help. 
and go to family, friends, neighbors, members of your church, people in the community, anybody you can find who can join your team. We always remind people this is not a solo sport. This is a team sport. And when you start getting overly tired, it is definitely time to bring in some new team members. Very, very important is taking breaks. They can be small, they can be large. It can be as simple as letting yourself get out of the house, walk outside, take some deep breaths, just have a little bit of downtime for yourself and just walk around and let some things go. Focus on relaxing. You might want to run out for shopping trips just to be by yourself. I can remember wandering the halls of a local department store. I wasn't there to buy anything. I was there to be by myself. Just getting away so that you're not carrying that load for a little while. It's just you that you're taking care of for a few minutes. It might be meeting a friend with her coffee for lunch. Those kind of getaways can be really, really helpful, especially if you are plugging into a friend who's either a really good listener or somebody who can just make you belly laugh and escape and move into a place of a little more joy for a few minutes. Many vacations are often very difficult for people to do, but it's really, really important to try to get away for a few days if you can. Um, you just need to remember that this is not selfish. You have to be resourceful in trying to find these getaways and these places. You may need to just put out the, use your network. Does anybody have a little place? We say like a condo at the beach for three nights just to get away. And somebody may know someone. Plug into that and don't feel guilty about it. This is a kind thing that you're doing. When you refresh yourself, you become a better caregiver. And so if you don't refresh yourself, you're going to get cranky. You're going to get short-tempered. You're not going to be there for your person the way you want to be there for your person because you don't have anything left to give. So remember, getting away is not a selfish thing. It's going to feel selfish. You're going to feel guilty. But remember, feelings and reality are not always the same thing. Reality is you've got to restore yourself if you want to be able to do this job. It's a long haul job. So don't beat yourself up. Just do it, people. Get away. Get those recharge times. Uh, someone in our in-person class mentioned this is a very important uh, thing, I think, uh, that I'm going to bring up. And I'm hoping to be able to get into an email, a photographed copy of a handout we gave the in-person uh, group uh, earlier today. Uh, and it is explaining mindfulness. And it's explaining what it is. And it's explaining how you do it, because that's one of those terms that's kind of wishy-washy. And uh, so we're going to try to get that to you in an email shortly after this class today. And uh, this person pointed out that, that mindfulness is something that was really going to help you here, uh, where you step back and you really do reflect on what's really going on inside yourself right now. And if you're beginning to get to this point where exhaustion is taking over, really do hope that you can plug in and do some of these things we're talking about and practice some mindfulness so that you are more in touch with what's going on. And mindfulness, being in the moment, focusing in, we're going to talk about that a little later in this talk as well. So let's move on to anxiety. Uh, the first suggestion that I have to you with anxiety is to practice a pause and whatever is going on. And here again, that mindfulness that we're talking about. Take several deep, calming breaths. Just try to do the opposite of what your body is pulling you into with that anxiety. This can really create a physical change inside of you. Uh, it helps your body chemically change. 
And so taking those calming breaths is not just a light kind of suggestion. It really can be a game changer for you when anxiety starts to want to creep in on you or any of these negative feelings, to be honest with you. Uh, see if you can identify any kind of distorted thinking patterns. And let's talk about a few of these here. The all or nothing uh, thinking. It's things like, oh, well, he's got dementia. I guess it's all over now. No more good times. No more joy. That's all or nothing thinking because it's not true. There are going to be moments of joy for you. There are going to be things that are treasures that you're going to have within the next few years that you're going to hold on to. And they're going to be the things that last in your mind. Believe it or not, they're there. You have to look for them, but they are there. Don't fall into that all or nothing thinking because it really isn't true. Most of this is just not all or nothing. Another thing we can fall into that's distorted thinking is fortune telling. And the fact is, none of us can tell what's ahead. We may have in our mind, oh, well, I know what's going to happen. I, I can sense what's coming. Mm, I think it's going to work out like this. I'm pretty sure. Yep. That's fortune telling. And fortune telling, once again, oftentimes is it's not true. We all know that. So don't fall into that, assuming you know what's going to happen ahead of time. Another kind of distorted thinking is mind reading. It could be something like, well, after what he just said, he's just, he just mustn't love me anymore. As a matter of fact, I'm wondering if he ever loved me. Okay, that's mind reading. You are putting into your head, what you think is in the head of the other person. And it may not be there at all, especially if this is dementia. One of the things we talk about in this classroom is personifying the disease. And in personifying the disease, whenever the person is doing something that is very negative and very much a symptom of the disease, by the way, you need to learn to separate their actions and their words from their personhood. Who are they? Your job is to outsmart that nastiness that's showing up. I named the disease Louie. I personified it, gave it a name. When John said something mean or hateful or had one of those looks on his face and said something that just hurt one of the grandchildren, I, would, I learned to say to myself, that's Louie talking, that's not John. John wouldn't have done that. John wouldn't say that. John loves those kids or he loves me. And so learning how to not label and mind read, labeling kind of goes with it because I would say, well, I could say, well, he's just mean. That's just all there is to it. He's mean. And I guess I'm going to have to deal with that from now on. That's kind of putting fortune telling in with it. Don't go there. He's just mean is labeling. And you need to personify the disease and go, mm -mm, no, that's the disease. That's not the person that I love and that I'm taking care of. So try not to fall into that distorted thinking of labeling and mind reading. Now, the next one on the list is shoulding. And I had not seen that before. I even mispronounced it as shoulding. What in the world is that? And then I realized it's when people are doing the oughts and the shoulds with you. Uh, they, uh, you say to yourself, well, they should have shown up to help me. It's the least they could do. Well, they should do that. What in the world are they thinking? Or John should know I'm just here to protect him. What in the world? That's shoulding because it sets you up to get into a negative spiral of thinking. You don't want to have the expectations of other people laying on top of what you are trying to do because honestly, you and I both know they don't have a clue what's going on and what you're what you're trying to pull off. If they haven't been there and done that, they lost the right to do any shooting and outing toward you. So don't fall into that distorted pattern of thinking. If you can develop an awareness of your self-talk, 
that's something that could be really valuable to you. Um, my husband, John, and I sought counseling help pretty early in our journey with LBD. And our counselor, Dr. Terry Ledford, taught us this important skill and made us aware of this. We believe what we say to ourselves more than what others say to us. We believe what we say to ourselves more than what others say to us. Learning to pay attention to our self-talk can be very impactful in changing our approach to caregiving and everything. We may be putting ourselves down, but you know, putting ourselves, oh, how could I have done that? I'm just an awful caregiver. What in the world? I don't have any business doing this, blah, 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 blah. Blaming others inappropriately. Well, why in the world didn't they show up? The least they could do. My goodness, that's his brother. My goodness, that's his child. Why isn't my child showing up? You can blame others inappropriately. Limiting your own resources is another way. You tend to talk to yourself. You can say, well, there's just no way to solve this problem. I'm just stuck here and there's nothing I can do about it. That's almost never true. And you can limit yourself by the things that you say to yourself. And until Dr. Ledford talked to us about this, and he had to keep bringing it up multiple times during the years that he took care of us, and eventually when John couldn't go anymore, just was taking care of me, he would have to remember, watch yourself talk. What are you saying to yourself? Because you're going to believe that more than what somebody else may be saying to you. So important skill to think about. What are you thinking about at 2 a.m. when you wake up in the morning? What are you thinking about? Very, very important. It helps some folks to actually write down their thoughts. And this can be just keeping a journal where you're just writing down what's going on and what you're thinking about. Positive, negative, whatever. One thing you may want to consider if you're doing that or inclined to do that is something called a gratefulness journal, where you are writing down the things you're thankful for, writing down the positive stuff that we sometimes take for granted. And one of the things that I would do over and over and over again, because my little brain just wasn't working very well at all, it was overwhelmed, when I'd wake up in the morning, I'd say, Lord, thank you for a safe, warm, dry place to sleep. And that may be the only thing I could think of to thank God for, to express gratefulness for. But it helped me start the day on a positive note instead of a negative note. And there is a lot of science to back this up, that the practice of gratefulness, the practice of thankfulness, using a gratitude journal Definitely, when people tested before doing that and tested after, they had a much more positive life view, life perspective. So there is some power in doing that. It's not just namby-tamby, goody-two-shoes, Pollyanna stuff. It really can have an effect on your approach, how you're thinking, how you're coming at the day. So I want to encourage you to do that. Try to get some form of support. Remember, we always say this is not us, this caregiving stuff's not a solo sport, it's a team sport. Don't try to go it alone. Find people you can get, you can add to your caregiver team, family members, neighbors, friends, people at your church, people at your community groups, all kinds of medical people that you're adding to your story. You want as much support as you can possibly get. And remember, I always say you are the coach of that team. And if you don't, if you try to go solo too long, remember, you can burn out and then you get into that exhaustion situation that we talked about earlier. OK, talking nicely to yourself. Remember the self-talk, talking nicely to yourself, remembering you are the one in the middle of the fray. You are the one who ran toward the fire and you're staying there. Pat yourself on the back, not to puff yourself up, not to become a proud person, not to be strutting around just, oh, I'm goody two shoes. But 
remembering you're there doing the hard stuff. So be kind to yourself. You should appreciate yourself and what you are trying to do without putting down others if you possibly can. So don't beat yourself up for the mistakes that you're making and remind yourself that what you're doing is actually heroic. Okay, let's talk about guilt. Guilt and worry are subtle and they can even be deadly enemies for many caregivers. So let's clarify the difference. Guilt is often about the past. You say things to yourself like, why didn't I do more? Why did I do that? Why did I say that? Oh, and you just beat yourself up over things like that. When you're feeling guilty, you can really emotionally beat yourself up for things that aren't even present in your life right now. They exist only in your mind. Regrets can haunt you if you let them. They can drain you. Is this your best choice when you have a lot to focus on right now? Now, what about the guilt that's in the present? You can be wrestling with issues right now. Should I kind of keep them home or should I put them in the facility? If I take a break, is that just going to crush her? Should I just stay here with her? You are going to be wrestling with things like that that will generate guilt. It's almost guaranteed. Just for most people, it just does. You can think, oh, I've got to get away. I've just got to get away. And then you're going to feel guilty about it. So these are the kinds of things that can really, really work on you. And what I want you to do when you're in these situations is try to use something that I call the best friend method. And you've heard me, if you've been here before, you've heard me talk about this. If you had a best friend who's been doing what you've been doing for the last fill in the blank amount of time, and it's probably a long time, what? and she came to you and said, you know, I think I really need a break. What would you say to her or to him? I think you probably would say to your best friend, of course you need a break. Let me see if I can help you find a place at the beach. Maybe I'll go with you if you want a companion. You would be supporting that person in their need to get away because you'd recognize it as the common sense, practical thing to do that was good for everybody in the long run. So do that for yourself. Be your own best friend. Treat yourself as lovingly as you would treat your best friend. Now, here are some specific strategies that come from the Dementia Alliance. Um, uh, it used to be uh, Alts NC, and this was a flyer that they put out years ago. And so we're going to run through these real quick. Number one, don't try to bury these feelings. Acknowledge them. They just are what they are. You are not alone in them. Every caregiver on the face of the earth is facing at least most of these things, if not all of them, that you're facing. So you don't need to beat yourself up. Just acknowledge yeah, it is. The feelings are what they are. And that way you're not tamping it down and it eventually brills into something called anger and where you really can end up lashing out doing things you really, really don't feel good about. So think about some quality time too, some creating moments of joy. And here again, I'm going to hold up a book and it's always hard to see with my camera, but this is called Creating Moments of Joy by Jolene Bracky, J-O-L-E-N-E, -E, Jolene Bracky, B-R-A-C-K-E-Y, Jolene Bracky, Creating Moments of Joy. Uh, Jolene is a medical type person who has worked with um, folks in dementia care, and she does it in more of the institutional places, uh, the nursing home types of places. But this book is just full of one good idea after the other where you can do something that generates joy. Um, I do want you to try to think of as many quality time things as you can. And some of them are as simple as just sitting and having a cup of coffee out on your porch and listen to the birds sing, taking a walk with your loved one if they can still walk around with you. Just little quality moments. I promise you, 
when your journey's over, those are going to be like jewels, treasures for you. You're going to remember those sweet times when you let everything stop and you just had a moment of joy and just quiet quality with your loved one. Do take advantage of those. That is going to push back so much guilt. Guilt can't live where joy is. Establish your priorities. What is really, really important in your caregiver journey? Uh, and we stopped and we, you know, we don't break up our, our thing here when we're recording, but uh, it, it we, we took some time in the in-person class to get people to talk about where their priorities were. And we had several good answers. It was like keeping my loved one safe, uh, making sure my loved one has an easy, uh, journey, as easy a journey as possible. Um, and someone, I said, well, what's the thing y'all aren't talking about? And uh, somebody did pipe up and say, taking care of myself. And I said, there you go. That is, should be one of your priorities. Uh, we want to make sure that we have a gentle journey. And that means for you as well as your loved ones. So remember what your highest priorities are. You also are going to have to set limits in all kinds of areas. Setting limits not only uh, for what you allow in terms of how other people treat your loved one, um, but also things that have to do with your emotions and taking care of yourself so that you don't become overwhelmed by this. You've got to, you've got to recognize that there are things that can overwhelm you and put some boundaries and some separation there so that you can make decisions that protect you as well as your loved one. Redefine your concept of caring. As this journey unfolds, you're going to be able to see how the needs change. The needs change for your loved one. The needs change for you. Uh, you could have something medically that happens to you that you can't do certain things that you did before. You just can't physically do it. And so that means you have to redefine your concept of caring. You may have to shift from taking care of them at home to taking care of them in a facility. And then your role is going to change. You're not going to stop caregiving. Just the kinds of things where you spend more of your time are going to shift from when you were having them at home versus when you're having them in a facility. So redefining your concept of caring is something that can make you feel guilty. Like when you're making that transition from home to a facility, there's a lot of guilt attached to that for most people. So redefining that concept, reframing things can definitely help you manage with that guilt issue. Here's some more things from Dementia Alliance. Oh, this is so important. Act from love, not from a sense of death. Uh, I really have found that um, this can be a massive issue. Uh, the difference in taking care of my husband versus taking care of my mom, this kicked in big time for me because I feel a sense of debt. She took care of me. She loved me unconditionally. She just, uh, she did wonderful things. Like I'd say, well, she made wonderful meals every single day, three times a day, and dessert was always included. Mama was that kind of mama. I owe her a lot for giving me a foundation that was solid and built on unconditional love. And now I felt that I need to pay that debt back. What I realized was there's a little catch in that that can make you get to a point of resentment at some point. And shifting to acting out of just love changes all of that. It's no longer a debt payment. It's a love issue. Bringing love, bringing grace into the room, powerful game changer. So remember to act from love, not from a sense of debt. Forgive and seek forgiveness. Oh my goodness, yes. We can feel eaten up with guilt because we just can't let something go. 
We've got to hold on to it. They did us wrong, and we're not letting them off the hook. But guess who really gets on the hook? You're on the hook. They may be walking around absolutely unaware, or, you know, they just don't care that much. You're the one on the hook. So forgiveness, seeking it, giving it to yourself, offering it to others, massive game changer. And guilt can't live where forgiveness dwells. So please remember that is a powerful, powerful thing that you have power over that you can choose that can make a big difference. Foster their independence. You do want to let people with dementia do as much as they possibly can. Now, good conversation. Uh, good conversation that we had in class today was sometimes when you ask them to be independent, uh, it can drive you nuts. Like if they're used to washing the dishes, this was the example today, and uh, they can't do it anymore. And whenever they wash the dishes, you end up having more work to do because they put the dirty dishes from the dishwasher in the cabinet. And then you've got to figure out what's clean and what's dirty. Uh, so you may want to shift that a little bit to, okay, could you be sorting the laundry while I'm washing the dishes or or while I'm cooking supper? Or could you do this? Give them something to do that was is within their realm of being able to do it. And if they misfold the laundry, who cares? That kind of stuff. Learning to let go also while you're fostering their independence, as long as it's safe. And something that's that's not going to make that much difference in terms of your own stress. Face the facts. Whatever the facts are, they just are. If you can no longer take care of your loved one at home for fill in the blank reason, and there can be multiple ones, it's a fact. It's not your fault. It's just a fact that can help you walk away from that guilt, being haunted by the guilt. Do not succumb to peer pressure. Peer pressure of, well, you would have thought that she'd have kept him home, wouldn't you? I sure wouldn't do that to my loved one. Spoken by someone who could well exactly do that 10 years down the road. So don't succumb to that peer pressure. If somebody isn't walking in your shoes, they have no idea what they're talking about. They may think they do, but they don't. So don't succumb to that. Okay, let's shift over to worry. Worry has to do with what may happen in the future. When you're worrying, you're usually asking yourself what if questions. Now, these are not the same as the what ifs that you ask when you're doing something positive or some proactive problem solving. They're often thoughts about things that could, but may never happen to you or your loved ones. Worry-based what-ifs tend to be circular emotionally. And by that, I mean, they tend to just keep coming back. They come in, well, what if I, what if I run out of money? What, if, what am I going to do if I run out of money? Well, uh, can I do something with that? Should I shift my money? What should I do? What if, I'm just so worried about it. And it goes and goes and goes and goes. And at two o'clock in the morning, it goes and goes and goes. That's circular emotionally. Uh, they make you wring your hands. Uh, they pester you. They uh, keep coming into your thoughts. Those are the kinds of things, the what ifs that you should avoid. Now, there is another kind of what if that you should substitute for that. And that's the problem solving what ifs. Because that's that's good stuff. That means you're moving forward. You're being productive. You're being positive. You're being proactive. And they help you make good plans to handle the caregiving better. They make you feel more in control. They make you feel less stressed. So let's look at an example of both types. Uh, a classic question like I brought up before, what about your finances? Everybody who's caregiving except multimillionaires have this problem. The worry-based stuff creates churning within you. You keep repeating it. You keep looking at the bank account. You go to the computer, you open up and look it up, or you open up the envelope and you look and you watch that money going down and that's worrying you. The problem-solving what if means you make a plan. You talk to a trusted family member who's really good at finances. You go to an aging care manager and ask them, who might you consult or what are some basic things you can do 
to handle your finances better, especially do this as early as possible right after the diagnosis, because in case you do run out of money, Medicaid does that five-year look back, and you need to be able to be ahead of things if at all possible. You might need to see an elder attorney or look online for different options and different strategies. You might have to take action to protect investments and assets that you have. Discuss options for different situations. So the same questions <clears throat> with a different approach can be healthy and helpful. So if you go, what am I gonna do about my finances? Do it the more positive, proactive way. Now, both of these can put you into a state of stress. And the most effective tool for handling both of these involves learning to focus your mind on what is happening in front of you right now. And when I'm talking about both of these, I'm talking about guilt now and worry. So guilt and worry together. If you can focus your mind on what's happening now, right now, in the moment, it's going to help you. Learn to focus. It's called, it's, it's kind of a mindfulness. Remember when I told you about that uh, paper at the very beginning? That mindfulness is going to help you get in touch with what you're feeling. It's going to help you calm down and it's going to put you more in the moment. Uh, because this is what the counselor, uh, Dr. Ledford, taught me and John. He said things like this. If you're, ta if you're thinking about the past and you're dwelling about the past, about what happened in the past and, and how it's making you feel guilty, how it's making you worry about things even now, you can't change that. It's not real. There is nothing you can do to change it. The present is right now. This is where you can actually affect change. The future you may do some things that will make the future better now in the present. But generally speaking, when you project, when your mind goes off into thinking about the future, the what if, what if, what if, a lot of that stuff, or what, if, what how is that going to unfold? A lot of that stuff may not unfold at all the way you think it is going to. The only thing that really you can change for certain, the only thing, is the present because we only live in the present. So for certain, you can't change the past. You can't change a lot of the future, but you most definitely can change things that are happening in the present. And that I hope will empower you. Here are some quotes from John Ortberg, um, and it's from a book called, If You Want to Walk on Water, You Got to Get Out of the Boat. And here's what he said about worry in particular. Worry is a special form of fear. Worry is fear that has unpacked its bags and signed a long-term lease. Worry never moves out of its own accord. It has to be evicted. Fear destroys joy. Live in it and you will know the pain of constant, chronic, low-grade anxiety. When I live with a fear-filled perspective, I give my imagination power to rob me of life now. When I live in fear or worry, the power of the what if becomes overwhelming and I will go through my life without joy. Joy and fear are fundamentally incompatible. Aha, uh -huh. aha, uh -huh. joy and fear are fundamentally incompatible. So let's lose joy, use joy to neutralize fear and worry. Choose it consciously, choose it strategically. These are things that you can do. Go out with a friend who just makes you belly laugh. Watch a silly TV show from the good old days or now. Something that makes you laugh, that just tickles your sense of humor. A movie that lifts you up. 
Watch Steve Hartman's kindness series. Oh, my goodness. You talk about joy and, and good feelings. Well, uh, go on YouTube and look up Steve Hartman, Kindness 101. He has one thing after another that will bring you joy, that will bring you such enjoyment. I mean, you can you glow with it by the time you listen, you watch a couple of those little short videos, and they are very brief, but they're wonderful. Things like that can neutralize fear. It neutralizes worry because it generates joy. Find those things that will lift you up and you're going to neutralize a lot of that joy. We need to reframe how we look at things. We need to let ourselves off the hook. We need to recognize traps and energy drainers for what they are, guilt and worry. So we don't get trapped in those things. Are you giving all you know how to give? Then let yourself off the hook. Because what's the payoff for feeling guilty or worrying or being exhausted? What's the payoff, people? What do we get out of that? We let anxiety build up when we don't give ourselves any break, we let exhaustion come in. That's the payoff for this stuff. So we want to be sure that we don't go there. And I just I just can't think of anything in this context that's positive or productive about life in general, let alone caregiving, if we focus like that. None of these things we've talked about today, not guilt, worry, exhaustion, or anxiety, can make you a better caregiver, but they sure can make you a worse one because they're going to drain you of all your energy and you're going to have less to give and that's going to make you feel guiltier and more stressed. So remember, identify these things for what they really are. It may help you to have a trusted person or two in whom you can confide and who'll give you feedback about the inevitable choices that you're going to be forced to make during this caregiver journey. Listen to those people. They're going to help you know when you're beating yourself up or you're falling into one of those traps. That's what my family had to do for me. They had to say to me, Mom, we're getting more worried about you. We're getting more worried about you. We know we can't stop what's happening to Dad, but we're worried about you. And for a long time, I just kind of pushed them off. And then I realized, whew, they're right. They're standing outside the woods. I'm inside the woods. They can see what I can't see. I need to listen to them. So be sure that you do listen to those people. This is your caregiver season. If you can master in this season the enemies that you have, the worry, the guilt, the anxiety, the exhaustion, you're going to feel more peace. You're going to feel more satisfaction in your caregiver season. And remember that it is just that. It's a season of your life. It's not your whole life. And most people are going to have some contact with this kind of season in their life. And I want to remind you before we go that you are doing God's work, people. Whether you realize it or not, it's a noble, it's a strong thing to be there for someone when they need you and they need this help. And my prayer for you is that this is your finest hour and thank you for what you do.